Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. In the spirit of the trees, in the spirit of all living nature, I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising on this Monday morning. I want to uh, begin our program by bringing you a brief update on Rick Buckley, uh, who, as many of you know, uh, had a fairly severe stroke uh, several weeks ago. I went to the hospital last night to visit him not having seen him for about two and a half weeks. And I wanted to report to everyone uh, that Rick is doing vastly better. Uh, he still uh, has no connection with his left side. So his left arm and left leg are, are still numb, uh, but he has full <clears throat> mental faculties. He's speaking again, uh, very uh, well. Uh, he's alert. Uh, he's able to uh, feed himself and do everything you can do with just one hand, in his case, the, uh, the right hand, uh, and sends his love and greetings to all of you out there in our Humanity Rising uh, community. Um, he is uh, very appreciative of all of your messages uh, on his website uh, and uh, emails and so forth. And sends deep love and deep, deep thanks uh, because he feels like he's being held uh, in our global uh, community and uh, takes sustenance from that and is nurtured by our love uh, and good thoughts. So I just wanted to bring you that update uh, with, uh, with Rick. Uh, let us pause as we always do as we begin our programs here on Humanity Rising and uh, just take a minute, center yourself in your body, close your eyes if you can, and attune yourself with your heart and for the next minute in the spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving. Feel your heart. Listen to your heartbeat. Send love to Rick and send love to people that you know. Thank you, everyone. We're going to spend this next week, this next five days, on the issue of democracy. Since the beginning of Humanity Rising in May of uh, 2020, as the pandemic was deepening all around us, and we at Ubiquity University, with hundreds of partners from all over the world, offered uh, Humanity Rising as a daily opportunity uh, for people everywhere. We had registrations from over 130 countries, of people who are coming in on a daily basis uh, to uh, view our programs. Uh, we begin to cover world events as they have transpired. So it was basically about the pandemic, but increasingly as time has moved on, we've taken issues of deep import. Uh, uh, we've covered the uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we covered the uh, killing of George Floyd and the uh, issues of race uh, in the United States and around the world. Uh, and uh, increasingly, uh, particularly as we focus on the November elections coming up uh, in the United States, uh, we've been focusing on democracy because it's clear 
I think to everyone, uh, that democracy is under assault uh, by Donald Trump uh, and the Republican Party. And uh, we need uh, to understand that. And we need to understand equally deeply that we're not going to solve any of the major issues that are confronting the world community uh, today unless we have a democratic process. And so the, the crisis of democracy and the assault on democracy in the United States is something that uh, if we succumb to the authoritarian um, uh, tendencies that are out there, will have reverberative effects all over the world uh, in a negative direction. So there's a lot at stake. And it's been George Capanelli, who's the founder and CEO of Age Nation, uh, who's been a strong supporter of Humanity Rising and is working with us, as we've said before, uh, to develop the Humanity Rising Network, which we'll be talking more about over the next days and weeks. Uh, George has really developed a passion uh, for preserving democracy uh, in America. And this is the second week that he has convened. There will be others as we move toward the November uh, election. But this is the second five-day program on Humanity Rising that's been convened uh, by George. So, George, I want to thank you for everything that you've, you've done to bring this very important issue to our uh, global community. I welcome you to Humanity Rising, and I turn the program over to you. Jim, thanks. Uh, and thanks to you and the Ubiquity team and Humanity Rising team for creating this platform that uh, we can use for topics like this. It's a pleasure partnering with you and look forward to great things in the future together. Um, I also want to welcome all of you who are uh, participating with us live and will be participating with us uh, via the replay. There'll be links and things that will allow you to know where to go and how to watch those replays and recommend them to friends. I really encourage you, if you weren't part of the first week, uh, Georg will put a, a, a link in the chat uh, that will let you go and search for and find those programs. Five really remarkable programs, not by virtue of the fact of what Jim or I did, but the individuals who were on it have so much to share with people all across America, as our two guests today uh, also have a just tremendous amount to share. Um, so um, before I introduce our guests, I just want to say a few more words in addition to Jim's about why Jim and I uh, John Steiner and Margot King have collaborated on this series and why it's so important to us. As Jim said, uh, we believe profoundly that we're at a seminal time in history and that there is so much on the line and that what we do uh, over the course of the next seven months and beyond will determine not only the quality and the depth and the integrity of our personal lives, but the lives of those we love, everyone we know, uh, and it will have a heck of an impact on the species that we're the stewards for and the habitat that we've abused uh, that really needs some serious regeneration. Um, so um, I, um, I just want to speak to you from my heart to yours. Um, what we do individually as citizens and collectively as what we call we the people, which is the fifth estate in our system of checks and balances, uh, will really determine our future. Um, as we've been told before, democracy like life itself is not a spectator sport. We can't just do it when we feel like it. Uh, if we have a few extra minutes, maybe we'll devote some time and attention to. Uh, democracy is a full-time job. Uh, our attention, uh, what I call the exercise of the power of one. That's the power of our vote at ballots, the, vo the power of vote with money and with attention. It's what we do every single day uh, to practice and demonstrate uh, the inalienable and uh, 
uh, endowed right, rights that we have not only by virtue of our constitution, but by our birth as human beings. These are the things that we have to pay attention to. The right to protest, the right to have oversight over the other four estates in our government. These are critical things. And if we do them, democracy succeeds. And if we don't, then democracy does not succeed. And as anyone who has studied the slow decline of free governments into autocracies and beyond will attest to, it's what we the people do or do not do ultimately that makes a difference. So that's why we're convening a terrific group of authors and activists and advocates and uh, public leaders, elected leaders and candidates uh, and private citizens in this uh, democracy series. So today we invite you to, as you, as you, as you listen, uh, not only listen but hear, as you watch, not only look but see, um, and comprehend not just with your mind but with your heart, because uh, there's an awful lot on the line. Thomas Jefferson a long time ago said, uh, when we, the people, become inattentive to civic affairs, legislators and judges and governors, and I now add presidents to that list, can become wolves. Um, and we need to do all that we can. And our two guests today are people that not only are doing, but have done just an enormous amount in their lives. So, um, Mark, if you'll come on, and Stephen, Steve, if you will as well. Mark Gerzon uh, is a longtime friend. I'm privileged to know him <clears throat> and really uh, have been proud of him for a long time for the quality and depth of the work that he has done. Uh, part of our conversation today is going to be about his book, uh, The Reuniting. Uh, the Reunited States of America, and a PBS documentary that's been done about it. We'll have a chance to talk about it. We'll give you a link, and maybe we'll show you a clip. We'll see how the program goes. Um, Mark's uh, the president of the Mediators Foundation, uh, and he's a key architect of global leadership and an experienced conflictor and co facilitator in high conflict circumstances. Um, he uh, had the privilege at a time when uh, members of Congress were really talking to one another at a whole different level to convene some congressional re retreats uh, to try to bring greater understanding and transpartisanship uh, to the political process. Um, he's the author of numerous books, including uh, Leading Through Conflict, uh, Global Citizens, and the book we'll be talking about today, The Reunited States of America. So Mark, it's a pleasure to have you here and thanks for taking some time with us. Great to uh, be with you, George, and great to be with you, Stephen. Stephen uh, Olakara uh, is the founder uh, of uh, the Millennial Action Project, founder and CEO. Uh, it's a national organization that launched in an effort uh, to train young elected officials um, at the state and congressional levels to build diverse coalitions for real change. Um, um, and has done a really extraordinary job, such a good job that he's now being elevated, uh, we certainly hope, uh, to the Senate uh, from Wisconsin. And we'll have a chance to talk to Stephen both about the work that he's done with the Millennial Project, uh, the work he's done with Mark, and the work that uh, he's now doing in an effort to bring uh, much greater consciousness and positive focus uh, to the Senate from Wisconsin. Stephen, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to begin, uh, Mark, first with you and then with Stephen, uh, with just a, a brief statement. Why do you do the work you do? Um, I do the work I do to give myself hope and to make me feel like I'm acting from integrity. And um, 
I don't feel like I'm acting from integrity when I pit people against each other. Um, I feel like I'm acting from integrity when I try to bring people together uh, in common cause. And so I just, I, I, I'd like to say I, I do what I do pretty selfishly motivated. <laughs> I want to feel hope, but I want to feel integrity. And, uh, and then I surround myself with people who inspire me. That's, you know, you and Stephen being two. Um, because uh, there's a lot of things that are dispiriting. Uh, there are a lot of things that are discouraging. And so I like to surround myself with people who are inspiring and encouraging just um, from a very selfish point of view. I, I'll end with this. I saw some trees last week in Central Park and their branches were twisted and gnarled and turning all to find the light. They would twist in every conceivable direction to get some light for their leaves. I saw branches that had twisted eight, 10, 12 times in the course of their life to get that light. So that's what I've done. I've just, I've just tried to follow the light and I'm sure we'll talk about that in this conversation. Thanks, Mark. And I can attest to the fact, uh, I was trying to remember when we first met in Santa Monica 40 years ago or whenever the heck it was, and you've been in the trenches ever since. Yes, and meeting people like Stephen. So Stephen, welcome. I'm, I'm, well, how, yeah. would you, how would you respond to George's question? Why do you well, do it? You? Yeah, well, thank you, George, and for having me, and Mark uh, for making the connection to be here. I think the active bridge building was built into my upbringing and my DNA and my experience as an American. My parents are immigrants from India. I grew up in a suburban, largely white and conservative uh, part of Wisconsin in the greater Milwaukee area. And it's a highly racially and politically segregated area as well. And so I was always interested in how I can connect and build community with people around me, despite them having completely different backgrounds than me, not looking anything like me. And for me, that first vehicle for building community was music. And music allowed me not only to build partnerships, but also for other people to humanize me and not just see me as the other uh, and vice versa. And by building me and co coalitions through music initially, uh, I was able to find creative ways to transcend the political and racial divides of the greater Milwaukee area. And once I saw that happening and I saw the magic of those collaborations, not only did our music get better, but I found my self so much more fulfilled, tapping into different subcultures within the greater Milwaukee area and seeing how we could achieve more than the greater sum of our, greater than the sum of our parts. And so uh, I wanted to find a way to build on that. And when I saw just how not only polarized our politics was at the time, this is about 15 years ago, but also the trajectory that we're on, I knew that we needed some systemic changes and that's what prompted me to express what I was doing primarily through music. And I think jazz in particular is a great metaphor for this type of practice, call and response and being fully present and full expression of yourself. Uh, but I really felt like I could contribute as a bridge builder uh, on the political stage. And that led to founding the Millennial Action Project and now running for the US Senate in Wisconsin. Uh, and we are definitely under threat with democracy uh, with the incumbent in this race, who's uh, Ron Johnson. I hope to not only defeat him, I think that's an easy thing to say, but more replace that style of anti-democratic politics that elevates consciousness and bridge building and, and a sense of belonging. Thank you, Stephen. And I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. Um, Mark, talk to us a little bit about where did... Uh, I mean, obviously, what you said before is part of that, but uh, where did uh, the reunited States of America come from? Uh, it, it came from a concern in 2015, George, that uh, the 2016 election was going to be the worst in our history. And uh, I felt that before Donald Trump uh, entered the stage um, and Trump you know, made it so even more than I expected. But I thought, everything I'd learned, I thought I wanted to put into a small, simple, direct book about if you really do want to reunite America, what would you do? And just, I want it to be simple and clear and easy to hold in your hand. And uh, 
not, you know, something that would inspire people to say, okay, maybe this is the worst election we've ever had in our history, or at least one of the worst, but I'm going to do some things that reunite America. And that's what it was about. Very simple and straightforward. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was unfortunate that the 2016 election got, became sort of a referendum on Trump because it took a lot of oxygen out of people's learning styles. People loved him or hated him. And um, the learning that I hoped would happen uh, has happened as the film and Steven's work and other things have shown, but it's taken a lot longer than I had hoped. Uh, but that was the inspiration to create a positive strand amidst what was gonna be a very negative election. Give us just a little sense of the flow of the book. Where, where do you go in it? Well, this, this podcast illustrates um, the first chapter, which is about learning. I make the argument that um, the first responsibility of a citizen is to learn, not to shout, not to advocate your point of view, um, not to join a party, not to make financial contributions. Your first, your first obligation is to learn. And I think the founding fathers and mothers knew that. That's why they made public education part of our culture. That's why there's a public university in the town that I live in, you know, Boulder, Colorado. We have a tradition of that because the, 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 the founders knew that they could not found a new country without learning. Well, that was, you know, more than, you know, two centuries ago. And I think the same thing applies today. I don't think we're going to solve any of the issues we talk about today, whether it's immigration or nuclear weapons or Ukraine or the Internet or social media or privacy or global terrorism or tariff and trade. You cannot go to the Constitution. And, and have the constitution give you the answer to all those questions. You actually have to learn. And, uh, and so I'm a, the first chapter is about learning. And just very quickly, you know, if, if you're a learner, the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna have relationships with people who are different from yourself. And that's about what chapter two is about is, hey, okay, if you really wanna learn, have relationships with people different than yourself. Uh, and Stephen's organization of Millennial Action Project is a good case study. It's all these young legislators from both parties learning from each other. Then the third chapter is saying, okay, if you're, if you're going to learn and you're going to relate to people different, then why don't you work on a problem and see if you can fix it? So that's about third chapter is about problem solving. And then the fourth and final chapter is about governance, just that, yes, individual citizens can learn and individual citizens can reach out and individual citizens can do what we're doing here today and try to solve problems. But ultimately, you need to have a government that works because that's what takes things to scale. So that's the one, two, three, four uh, of the book. Very straightforward, very direct, and very easy to read because... Uh, I don't people don't think people should have a, have to have a PhD to be a citizen of the United States. Stephen, how did you meet Mark and get involved in that part? Uh, through the movement, uh, uh, you know, Mark and I have had the chance to collaborate for many years. And when the documentary film crew reached out and they said that Mark was an executive producer on it, that was really the green light for me to to say yes, I'll, I'll be a part of this. And I also saw among the filmmaking crew, they had a real desire to tell the true story and be creative and even a little experimental to try and tell that story, the human side of that story to a larger audience. And I've strongly believed that the bridge building movement has needed to move from the uh, non-mainstream and into the mainstream of American politics and transitioning from the so-called fringe to the mainstream is a massive undertaking given that there's a multi-billion dollar political industry that is profiting on making us hate each other that's profiting on really the opposite of a lot of what we're talking about so to accomplish that it's a lot of work but having a widely seen documentary is certainly one of the big things uh, you can do so people know that this is an option available to you you can show up in your life and in your democracy in this way that upholds empathy and dignity uh, for, for all of us. And, uh, and one of the creative ways that Ben, the director of the film was able to tell that story is he noticed how I did keep coming back to jazz as a metaphor for our democracy and how we wanna show up. And I always use that metaphor because it indicates that we're not finding some kind of least common denominator. I don't always ask people to sit you know, we're not meeting at the 50 yard line on a football field. This is an evolutionary process. When you think about Dr. King's ideas for civil rights, those were radical, non-mainstream and, and often shoved aside in the 1950s and early 60s. 
And so to bring that to the mainstream, he had to raise consciousness across uh, the races. And in many ways, I think that's what we have to do uh, with our movement. So that is an evolution, not at the 50 yard line, but moving to a new playing field altogether. And when Ben demonstrated that commitment to me with the film, uh, I knew I'd be a part of it. And he was able to integrate not only the work we do politically to transform American democracy with Millennial Action Project, but also he actually organized an opportunity for me to play jazz uh, in the film. And I think it was beautiful because I had never met those musicians before. We had no idea what we were gonna play as we're walking on stage. And we called off those tunes while we were performing live for people. And I felt like that was just a beautiful moment because that moment only happens what you see on the film because we listen to each other, because we empathize and sought to see the humanity in each other. We had active communication and we're fully present to create some beautiful music together. So that's how I got a part of it. <laughs> um, and it's a beautiful moment in the film as well um, for, the, for all of those reasons. I don't know if you know, um, but Carl Jung described something uh, when he was studying the Nazi experience and he called it the totalitarian virus. And the Algonquin, Cree, and Ojibwe tribes before him uh, defined something called Wetiko. Wetiko. Uh, and uh, the cure uh, from both of those perspectives is creative expression. Uh, because when creative expression occurs between us and within us, it happens just the way you described it in terms of your jazz. People come together, they listen, they integrate, they elevate, uh, and something magical comes out of it, you know? Um, Mark, the film uh, is now playing on PBS still in most in many stations around the country? No, the PBS run was in January, and now if people want to watch it, they need to go to Amazon Prime. Um, okay. and, and it should be on Amazon Prime indefinitely. Uh, but it did have a wonderful run on PBS and was picked up by more stations than almost any other independent documentary that they'd recently been offered. And I was very pleased because uh, it reached a lot of homes through PBS and a lot of people uh, who would have never seen it, who just don't go to Amazon Prime. But right now, if, 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 if someone listening to you, you know this Humanity Rising wants to watch uh, the United States film, they need to go to Amazon Prime. So um, uh, obviously one of the things that made it really intriguing and successful was there was a Republican couple that was traveling around the, the country, uh, engaging with people and themselves learning, since that's the first chapter of your book, uh, themselves learning. And uh, I want to ask both of you, um, clearly, uh, Steve, as you said, the, 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 there's this multi-billion dollar industry that is uh, somehow or another keeping us from uh, engaging and understanding one another. And there's also billions of dollars behind that of other people who are trying to stir the pot and further divide us. Uh, will you, both of you, have had a significant different experience in your dialogues with Republicans, whether they're young legislators or other people in the public. Can you share, without having to disclose names and all of that, but can you share some of your experiences? Absolutely. I love talking about this because it shows people that change and coalition building is possible. And one of the common uh, questions I hear is, how do you build a bridge if you have no one to build a bridge to? Well, let me share a few examples of how we have. One was during the elections leading up into the uh, 2020 presidential election during the height of the pandemic. And there is a need to expand vote by mail in our country and strengthen the absentee voting systems uh, so that people can express themselves safely uh, on election day. And there, Voting rights, as we all know, is one of the most divisive issues in America right now. And yet with Millennial Action Project, our approach was the same we've always had, which is let's not write anyone off here. Let's reach out to some of the partners we've had over the years and see if there is something that we could work together on. Because this is, I mean, even in like spring of 2020, <clears throat> I knew that if we don't have a safe and legitimate election, things could go in an extremely destructive path. 
And uh, so I, I was reaching out to a Republican state legislator here in Wisconsin and someone who we had worked on uh, workforce development issues on. I can guarantee you he's done nothing on human right, uh, uh, on voting rights before. And I was actually having uh, talking with him before I had him on my podcast. And I said, you know, we really need to strengthen the absentee voting system. And, and, and he says, you know what? Like, I fully agree. We need to strengthen the voting uh, system here before the election. And, you know, Republicans, we actually believe in absentee voting and we have for many years. Uh, so this really shouldn't be a partisan issue. And I said, would you be willing to talk about that publicly uh, with me? And he said, absolutely. And so we created the only bipartisan public service announcement in the country to promote safe voting. And because of that bipartisan coalition we built, because it was not only him, because of his leadership, we were able to bring on a few others as well. We were able to successfully reform the absentee voting system here in Wisconsin. All registered voters were mailed an absentee uh, a ballot request. Any unregistered voter was given a postcard in the mail so they could learn how they could register uh, online. And that was a huge, huge win. The second one I'm particularly proud of was in the wake of the Parkland shooting. There's a sense in this country that we need to do something about gun violence, but this issue also is very polarizing. And yet what happened was those students came to Washington DC, called in the conscience of this nation and we had been building bipartisan relationships in Congress with our, what's called the Future Caucus. And there was a group there, Democrat and Republican, who agreed that we should do something about gun violence, that the CDC should be authorized and funded to study gun violence as a public health issue. And because of that initial coalition we formed, we introduced the legislation, additional people jumped on, and Eventually, so many people jumped on board that it became kind of a political non-issue. And so that bill passed through both chambers of Congress and was signed into law by the president. This was the first gun violence prevention bill to pass through Congress in over a generation. And it happened because we led as bridge builders. So when people say, well, this is impractical, it's too idealistic. I just tell people, look at the results. This is the most practical way to make change and at the end of the day, if you care about action, you have to build bridges. And that's what these examples show. Thanks, Stephen. Mark, what about you? Your time when congressional retreats and since, what's your experience with the dialogue across the aisle? Well, I'll start my answer by referring to the couple in the film who you mentioned. Um, David Leverton was a Republican operative who did kind of not quite dirty tricks, but did whatever he needed to do to get Republicans elected. And um, he was driving one day in Dallas and where he lived, working in the oil and gas industry. And he, he happened to hear me doing an interview on PBS, uh, NPR, I guess it was. And, um, you know, he thought, oh, I'll get that book. And anyway, long story short, within months, he and his wife have sold their house, bought a van and decided to travel to all 50 states. Now, why did they do that? Because they're very, very deeply Christian couple and they care about love. They take it seriously. And they thought to themselves, and this is literally what they said to me, Mark, how can we love America if we don't know America? How can we love America if we've never seen America? Now, we don't all have to get a van and travel to all 50 states. But David and Aaron are the kind of people who that's, you know, that's what they did. They, and, and I, I salute them for that. And I, I think it, to me, it it's illustrates my answer to your question, which is, you know, if you do what Stephen just told, he, he did, which is you don't demonize a Republican, you befriend a Republican. Uh, and you can't befriend every Republican, but two out of three of them, you can at least, maybe more. And that's a huge, you have such a huge population. That's, that's millions of people and they're all around us. And that's what David and Aaron represent to me. And I think why they, why they <clears throat> are part of the film that, the, that Ben Rickey, the director of the film thought, this is a couple. And by the way, he started filming them at the beginning of the 50. So nobody knew. This is not like a canned thing where he tells the story going backwards. No, this is, he starts with them in the first state, you know, and, and, uh, and I'll just, you know, they go up from Dallas to Tulsa. And of course, what do they find out in Tulsa? They found out that there, there was an entire black part of the city that had a vibrant economy. And it was so vibrant that it started threatening the white people in Tulsa in the 1920s and they burned it down. And David and Aaron had the humility to say, I've never heard of the Tulsa massacre. 
never heard of it. And that's what I mean by learning. They, they were willing to be humble and they were willing to say, we're going to learn. And, and that's not the vibration we see today. The vibration we see today and have seen for some time is, is what I would call a know-it-all vibration. You run for office and it's one of the reasons I like the way Stephen is running for office. He's very confident about some of the issues he's working with, but it's not the confidence of a know-it-all. It's a confidence of somebody who's saying, I'm gonna learn. I'm here to learn from you and from Republicans and from my own experience. I'm here to learn, you know, and you can be a powerful leader modeling learning and inquiry. You, you don't have to think that power is equated with having the answer and being a, a blowhard. And, and so that's, that's the kind of leader we need more of. You can say that again and again and again, you know. Uh, the, uh, you said something, Stephen, about let's not write anyone off, you know. And I know in this world it is not an easy thing to do. The vitriolic and, you know, uh, blindsidedness that many of us have about the things that we believe. Um, and, uh, and yet if we don't, uh, you know, the, the word dialogue comes from the Greek meaning dialogos, which is to arrive at understanding through active listening. And unfortunately we seem, uh, in addition to patience, we seem to have lost the ability to listen. Uh, and so the work that you're both doing is really critical and important. Um, what are... Go ahead. Can, I just, yeah. can I just insert in there that, that in the intro to this podcast, you talked about, we talked about the Republican Party being the problem, and I think it is, but I want to make clear that I don't see the Democratic Party as the solution. Um, I see the solution as being this um, shift in consciousness and shift in attitude and shift in awareness. And if that flows through the Democratic Party, great. But ultimately, it's got to flow through both parties, um, because if it flows through one party only, all we're doing is strengthening one side against the other. And then we've seen in our country that you have a boomerang effect. You go from an Obama to a Trump, you know, and you can go from a Trump to a Biden and then you go from a Biden to a, we have, we don't know what. So I just want to be clear that, that I think the real shift is not let's get the democratic party back in power, but let's get everybody in power to have a different jazz like um, consciousness to what they're doing. And I, I personally, and I, I'll say this with all humility that I, I, my, my big learning experience in my 40s was when I was designing the co United States, re, the Congress for the retreat for the United States House of Representatives. I went as a kind of a, a liberal. Um, I was hired because I'd written a book called A House Divided. It described all the belief systems. But I, I was I was a liberal and I was shocked to find out that how many liberals I didn't like and how many conservatives I liked. It was like, oh boy, I had these hidden biases that I didn't know about. I thought I wasn't gonna like Republicans and I was gonna like Democrats. And the fact was that there were, there's consciousness in the Republican party that I really appreciated and people I really appreciated. And so it was a comeuppance for me. And it, it's a, I, was, I was blessed because most people are you know, hired by a Democrat or hired by a Republican. I was hired by a committee of five Ds and five Rs. So actually my job was to empathize. I couldn't do my job without empathizing. And, and I, I feel like that was, you know, I was being guided to take that job and not others because it taught me that we need to listen to the whole. And, and the whole includes the 70 million people who voted for Trump for whatever reasons. The whole includes those 70 million people. Well, you know, I, um, I just want to clarify when I say the Republicans, what I'm talking about is that minority that is clearly out to overthrow the government and do all of that. Uh, if I had to name a culprit, it's we the people uh, and our failure to pay attention, to be informed as citizens, uh, to play active roles. And yet, even there, that's a misstatement. When I think of the incredible number of people who are activists and uh, advocates and, and candidates and whatnot that are doing everything that they know how to do. Um, and, and, and the reason that I still uh, ask people to wake up uh, these days is that um, this is a seminal time. It is an existential issue that the process of democracy is what needs to be saved so that we can continue the process of listening, engagement, active uh, participation. Um, uh, unfortunately, 
there is a minority that is dedicated to the overthrow of this government. And that's something that people at least have to be upfront and recognize is true and needs to be addressed. Uh, Stephen, where do we go from here? What, what, what are the other issues as a candidate, for an example, what are the issues that you face that you need so real support from we the people and how do we the people give it to you and other candidates across the country who need that kind of support? Well, I think in addition to the cultural shift that we're talking about, the change in how we all show up, we also do need to change the incentives in our politics so that elected leaders who might be reasonable in person and in private don't have to turn into these hyper-partisan uh, you know, telemarketers essentially and cable news commentators that actively divide us. And so uh, just this past week, I announced our agenda uh, to make government work for the exhausted majority. The exhausted majority are you know, the vast majority of people who are tired of all the fighting, want to see government work and want to elevate our, our politics. And that's a cross-partisan group of people who feel disillusioned right now. And so one of the types of reforms I talked about, which is pretty common sense, which is members of Congress, you know, don't often do their job. Right now, they spend a majority of their time dialing for dollars from special interests. There's a process of legalized bribery right now in Congress, and we have to call it for what it is. And so I'm calling to ban members of Congress from fundraising uh, while Congress is in session. Do your taxpayer funded job. And what that allows them to do is spend more time building relationships and legislating as opposed to spending time across the street in their party headquarters constantly fundraising. And, uh, and we know what happens when it's all about fundraising. There's a huge incentive to uh, divide and incentive not to get things done. Uh, another big part of the reforms is uh, open primaries and nonpartisan primaries and having ranked choice voting uh, so that the candidate who's done the best job of bridge building is and the best job, therefore, of legislating will be the one that wins the election, not just the most uh, extreme voices who uh, profit on divisive rhetoric. Uh, so those are some of the examples of the incentives I think we can change. And now, how can everyone help? The style of candidacy I'm leading here in Wisconsin is something that every traditional political consultant would tell you not to do. Like it is right to call us crazy. This is not something that normal people do. Uh, it's not normal to run a campaign that is cutting against an entire business model in politics. And most people who just want to get elected the easy way are going to divide, polarize, hate, and then get elected and then don't do anything on the other side of being elected. So the idea of expanding the electorate, building a wide coalition, saying that we can see the humanity and dignity of each other, win, and then legislate to help the exhausted majority and the vast majority of people who aren't served by government and not the big money special interests, that is legitimately insane. And so the way that you can transition that from being crazy to being something that truly wins is to support a campaign like ours. Show that it's not going to be all the hate mongers and the fear mongers that we can win this style, with this style of politics. That means signing up to volunteer. It means donating. It means telling your friends, sharing on social media. Uh, the way that we build a movement is by each of us getting active. Like you mentioned in the opening, uh, democracy cannot be a spectator sport. You know, I met, I was, uh, we're, so right now we're gathering signatures to get on the ballot. We, we're gonna get 2000 signatures by June 1st. And so I was out yesterday, you know, with our team talking to voters just by the river walk here in Milwaukee. I met a woman who is uh, probably in her 80s, I would want to say. Uh, she's very disillusioned and she believes in everything that we're talking about. But she said, you know what? I don't think things are ever going to change. And I said to her, if everyone has that mentality, nothing's going to change. And she said, I know, I know I, I, you're right, but I'm just so disillusioned. But I'll tell you a hopeful note too. I met with a young woman who just immigrated from Guatemala and she is about to have her citizenship test on May 3rd. And she said, you're talking about a kind of politics that centers dignity. That is like, 
it speaks to my heart. And she said, you're going to be the first person I ever vote for here in the United States. And the election on August 9th here in Wisconsin happens to be your birthday. <laughs> so you think about how the universe works. It's pretty special. My favorite book is The Alchemist because it talks about when you walk in your purpose, the universe starts to conspire for your success. That's what I'm seeing here. And that's why I'm, I'm grateful to be with all of you because I think together, if every single person here posts about, you know, there's this new kind of candidate who's running a different kind of politics in Wisconsin, you post that on your Facebook right now, that's going to get people to pay attention. That's something we could do right now to help build the movement. Thanks, Stephen. I, you know, when you talk, I, I've managed political campaigns and uh, um, I've, I, I've always dreaded those moments when the, I would call them the bag man of the organization would come up to me. And before they gave me the check or the donation, I would have to promise and it didn't matter whether they were in favor of left-handed dog walkers or something far more seemingly significant. And uh, so I often say to people, again, a place that we the people can come in, is that if we don't insist on buying the politicians, they won't be for sale. And that then goes up the line to special interests and all the rest of it. But a bit, again, it begins with us. If we recognize that we're going to support a, a, a political candidate because we trust and value the, who they are and what they're going to do, and not because we're going to gain influence through them, yeah. it'll make a difference as well in the political process. Absolutely. Mark, talk about that, will you, or other things you see? Yeah, well, I'm... I'm as you were speaking, I was just thinking of a moment in the film, which you know everybody has their moment that they think is the most moving. And Stephen, I've never told you this, but I, the moment I find the most moving is that one of the Millennial Action Project meetings was in Iowa or somewhere I can't remember. But there's just these all these you know men and women in their 30s and 40s who are introducing themselves to the camera, and they'll say, "My name is so and so. I'm a Democrat. My name is so and so. I'm a Republican. I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Republican. I'm an Independent." And you see all these faces of all these elected officials, Democrats and Republicans at Stephen's Millennial Action Project event, working together like, you know, colleagues. Now, they differ on fundamental issues, and I'm sure they argue like, you know, it, it, you know vociferously. But that for me was the most moving because you just, to me, it was like almost like an antidote to the poison we see today. The antidote to the poison we see today is, oh, well, the Republicans are at this rally for so-and-so, and the De Democrats are at this rally for so-and-so. And at Stevens' meeting, they were all working together and saying, how are we going to deal with these issues we face as a country? And implicitly, how are we going to work together? Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd actually like to ask you, Stephen, what's, what's, the, what's the way you're harnessing that, what I would call that higher ground for Democrats and Republicans? How are you harnessing that higher ground energy for your campaign? Yeah, I, I think it's running in a different way because in a primary election the conventional wisdom is to go to the furthest extreme and in wisconsin we do have an open primary so democrat republican independent you can vote and i think there's a huge difference between the political bubble and everyone who lives their normal lives when i travel to just about every part of wisconsin we've done over 120 events here now People tell me we want leaders who have a collaborative approach, who have integrity, and who are going to deliver results. And the style of politics that we're talking about here speaks to those three things directly. And the traditional hyperpartisan candidates that are offered to people provide the opposite. And so you might wonder, how, so what's going on here where the vast majority of people are, are looking for X, and then the candidates that are offered to them are providing a why. Isn't that just a huge hole in the market? The answer is yes, yes. <laughs> and that's why I believe we can catch lightning in a bottle in this moment. The demand is there and now we're providing the option uh, for people. And when we speak truthfully and speak from the heart with my full authenticity, the way I would show up to a jazz performance, it cuts through on a deeper level for people. And that I think, Mark, is how we're reaching that higher ground. We're translating everything we did with MAP, Millennial Action Project, in terms of not writing off people having an inclusive approach and now translating it uh, into a campaign. 
And because it's so rare, people take notice. They say, wow, I've never heard of a candidate who talks like that. I've never seen a campaign that feels like this. We did an event recently here in Milwaukee and a, and a woman came up afterwards who was moved and she said, your campaign is like an energy that needs to be experienced. And I think that is really the, the higher ground. And it's infectious because in a good way, because people are yearning for that, but they don't typically uh, get it. And then the second part is when it's not only presenting that general atmosphere, that sort of vibration, but then being able to back it up with concrete legislative accomplishments. Uh, because everyone else who's running in this race, you know, they talk about X, Y, and Z, and they don't have the legislative track record. So then when people can realize that this is backed up by some real legislative work, that this is not pie in the sky, this is concrete, tangible, and practical, you're combining the vision for a new politics with the legislative experience, that's when it becomes real for people. And that's how I think we, we get to the higher ground. <laughs> Great. Uh, 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 the, one of the reasons we're doing this series is to do what you just did, Stephen, and that is not only to give examples and talk about issues, but uh, to give people a series of steps that they can take. It's interesting that someone in our chat, and incidentally, you'll both get copies of the chat so that you can treat this as a kind of town hall meeting and uh, get, uh, and, and as we move humanity rising even further in its next evolution, there's going to be a lot more interaction live between audience and, and speakers. But uh, someone said, when I was making that comment about bag men in organizations, uh, whether or not I was suggesting to people that they not donate. So I just want to be clear that I'm not making that suggestion at all. I want everybody to donate. I just want them to donate, not from a personal leverage standpoint, but for the good of the greater good and allowing us to elect people that aren't going to be then dialing for dollars. So I just want to clarify that. Mark? Yeah, I want to, I want to, I want to, actually ask for a learning opportunity in this podcast, George, because um, I have a learning edge that maybe Stephen or you or one of our folks on chat can educate me about. And my learning experience had to do with my work with Congress, because um, I designed the retreats the last time the Congress worked together and actually went on a retreat to learn how to work together was in 97 and 99, 25 years ago. And I designed those retreats. And my experience was that there were a lot of good people uh, some good people like Stephen will be if he, if he goes to the Senate or, you know, and this happened to be the House, but same principle. There were a lot of good people. Um, but what happened was that when any Democrat or any Republican started to work together um, after the retreats, and if they started to get some attention, and if they started to actually move some energy across the aisle, the Democratic or Republican Party leader would tell them, cut it out, stop it. We've got an election coming up uh, where we're, we, we can get more traction if we're opposed than if we look like we're working with them. So cut it out. And that was 25 years ago, but I just had a conversation with the chief of staff of a, of a Republican in the house. And I said to him, you know, are, are you working across the aisle? He said, oh yeah, we work across the aisle. He said, as long as we get no press and as long as it doesn't involve any money, we can do it. But as soon as it involves any attention or any money, the party leaders tell us to stop it. In fact, they do it on both sides. Uh, Kevin McCarthy does it, Nancy Pelosi does it. So the learning edge I have, and I'm putting the question to, to you, Stephen, but it could be to George or anybody listening is, let's say you get elected or somebody who gets elected to the House or the Senate, they get elected, you're the newbie. You know, you're, you're the newbie, you don't have a lot of power. Um, you're at the bottom of the totem pole. And particularly if you're independent, that the Democratic Party chair will, uh, you know, will not be kind of be a little skeptical about you. Um, try to get you back to kind of be in line, toe the line. And my question is, how does, how, does, how does this country change course when it has two party leaders that act like mini dictators to keep their people in line and in line means opposed to the other side? How, how does that crack in, in your view, Stephen? Yeah, I, I think the, you know, if you think about it, what, what does it take to become a party leader? to be a majority leader, a speaker of the house, minority leader. 
the incentives to get there and then the incentives to stay there. The number one job description you have if you're the majority leader or speaker of the house uh, is actually not to pass legislation. The goal is to elect more members of your party in the next election. And so when that is the North Star, you start to realize why the incentive is not to share credit, don't work together on a constructive bill, but instead keep the issue on the ballot and get people riled up about it. I mean, think about it. That is insane right now, that there's a greater incentive to keep an issue on the ballot than to constructively resolve it. And that's why so many issues you care about, climate change, immigration, economic mobility, keep staying on the back burner. And so I think part of what we have to do is those leaders are gonna respond, they are transactional politicians to the max. And the only way you change that is with incentive and system level uh, change. You know, I do think that a refreshing of leadership is certainly good because if you're coming in with a fresh perspective, you might find a new way to do things. But ultimately the incentives longer term uh, will be the most important factor and that's where I do think that some of the reforms we're talking about around uh, open primaries, ranked choice voting, getting big money out of politics, uh, gerrymandering reform, I think those things will make a difference because at the end of the day, if what you get, if, if what is good politics is passing legislation and working collaboratively on, on policy, then the party leaders are going to say, please work with the other side. Please get this legislation done, uh, because in most cases in Congress and nearly every state legislature, you're really not passing a bill unless you get a, at least a little bit of uh, crossover support. Uh, so I think that will be the sea change uh, that we're looking for. And then the other piece of that is the American public. You know, my job as a future U.S. senator representing Wisconsin is not only to work on legislation, that's a huge part of the job. The other part of it is to move the public conversation. And that's why I think this election is such a once in a generation opportunity to bring a bridge builder who wants to transform American politics to the national conversation. That is a new political archetype that does, like a new political lane that does not exist right now uh, on the national stage. And, um, and when we do that, and the American public is galvanized around that, then that also is going to change the calculus of the party leaders because they know that that's what their constituents and their members' constituents are going to want. You know, one reason that we had such broad support for the Millennial Action Project is because both parties knew they had to get young people ultimately to support them if they're going to be viable longer term. It, it's not politically popular to say, we hate young people. Uh, they want young people and they want them to vote for them. And so you got to get that kind of alignment of, of incentives. And I plan to galvanize uh, and excite the American public around this new lane in politics. Mark, if I can add a couple of things uh, from my perspective is um, I think that there is absolutely no doubt that we have to take money out of politics. Um, I think we have to stop the ridiculous process of having 24-7, 52-week-a-year, 52-year uh, campaigns for public office. Uh, we need to look at European systems that have 8- and 16-week campaigns uh, and uh, that are publicly funded. Uh, the other thing we have to do to take... The other thing we have to take out of politics are is the bullshit polling and survey business yes. uh, that is based on fraudulent methodology in the first place uh, that ends up, uh, uh, I mean, Kenneth Arrow told us a long time ago, you cannot aggregate information and arrive at truth. The only thing you do with aggregated information is prove both the thesis and its opposite on every issue. And yet we govern America by this fraudulent method of polling and surveys that are illegitimate and inaccurate. So those are two things that could help change the incentives 
uh, and make politics different from my standpoint. But then who am I? I'm just a private citizen, you know? Beautiful. Uh, you're, you're, you're part of we the people. And uh, in the chat, the, the issue has been raised about, you know, can't one party make progress on its own? Does everything have to be bipartisan? And I just want to underscore, yes, you know, fortunately, we can make progress with one party. In fact, we just elected a, a Supreme Court justice, a new Supreme Court justice was just put on the Supreme Court because we have a, you know, the, the Democrats plus three Republicans made it happen. So absolutely progress can happen with one party that wins an election or, or has the majority. And I'm all for it. Uh, when, of course, when it's the party I agree with. Uh, but I, I think the word I want to introduce to the conversation is enduring is can something enduring change? And what I've noticed is that, you know, yes, FDR's changes in the 30s, some of them endured. You know, Social Security has endured. Some things do endure over many, many administrations. But a lot of things are being flipped around, you know, whether it's an Iran uh, nuclear deal or attempts to undo Obamacare. Um, what we're seeing is, you know, one, one generation's victory is the next generation's uh, defeat. And it's like, we things we, I call it careening from left to right. And if you've ever been in a car that careens from left to right, you know that it's just an accident waiting to happen. So absolutely, if you can put a party in power, if we can have Democrats in control and Democrats do good things, fantastic. Well, that's fantastic. The question is how long will they last? And if they're important, look at abortion. I mean, I thought abortion was settled a long time ago and now it's back there again, why? because there wasn't a shift in consciousness, there was a shift in power. And I'm all for shifts in power towards the good. Um, if you watch the Navalny, if you watch the Victor Navalny special on CNN, you will see the answer about how you mobilize a citizen's campaign against tough odds. You will see how a citizen's campaign mobilizes against an authoritarian dictator dictatorial leader. And I, I, I'm, I'm gonna watch this, I'm gonna watch it again and again because Everything that Navalny and his people do um, is, a, is a tutorial for us about how you really change a system. And ours is tougher to change in some ways because there the, the enemy is Putin and the enemy is totalitarianism. Here, our enemy is much more complex. It's a system that you were describing very eloquently. Both of you were describing it. All those features, they're not accidents. They're not bugs in the system. <laughs> they are the system we designed. We, they're the system we designed. And that's, that's why there needs to be a system shift. And, and that's the challenge that I, that's my learning edge. And I invite everybody to share their learning edge because if it's, if it's the same one, that's, that's the challenge, not how do we get an individual to start meditating or an individual to start eating their you know, tofu yogurt, but to actually get a system change where the way we eat, the diet, our political diet shifts as a culture. And that's been my dream all along. And and what I'm excited about by Stevens' campaign and a few other candidates is that until we have candidates who run on this, not people on the sidelines who tell the candidates what they should be doing, but the actual candidates themselves, until we have candidates, and Steve and I would hope that at some point you would promote, and maybe this, George, you can promote, who are the other Stephen Olicaras in Arizona or Florida or Missouri or Maine or Michigan? Who are the other uh, younger candidates who, who have that air of freshness and how can we get more, more press for them? How can we get more money for them? How can we let them know they're not alone? Yeah. And just building on that, Mark, one of the, you know, uh, some of our, our senior political strategists, they were very early with, with Obama in, in 2007. And one thing they always highlight for me is the idea of a permission structure, because for our style of candidacy, it's such, it's electric. We have an amazing connection with voters on the ground and people say yes. And, and this, this has, does happen with others who might run in a similar way. Yes, that's what we need for the future of our democracy. But then when the cynicism starts to creep in, they start to ask themselves, yeah, but is it, is it really possible? And the key is creating the permission structure for people and that permission structure to not only want something, but then actively support it really is exactly the two things you highlighted, Mark. You, we got to attract more visibility um, for these candidacies, because if you see something about this candidate you love in your heart, and then you see maybe a sign or you see a friend wearing a T-shirt or you see something online or a news piece, you say, oh, wow, OK, so I'm not alone in supporting this. Other people 
are talking about it as well. That creates the permission structure. You know, certain types of endorsements can help in that way as well. But then also the money, because the number one way you get more media coverage in politics right now um, is by being able to show people you can raise money. And that's that is uh, the system as it is right now. And right now, the state's largest newspaper in Wisconsin, and they're really the only game in town. They decide whether or not the average person hears about our campaign. And uh, and I was, I, was, I was nodding my head earlier, George, when you were talking about the polling, because, you know, some of the media outlets, they don't even give the existing polling any kind of context. Like in our race, there's a self-funding son of a billionaire hedge fund manager from New York running for the U.S. Senate in Wisconsin. I did not make any of that up. That is all 100 percent true. And that guy is seen as one of the significant candidates. And the only reason why is because of his money. And in one of the recent news articles, they talk about, well, you know, the the higher raising candidates, they're, you know, so far ahead. And then they didn't say that actually they're only two points ahead of us in this campaign. So there's this cherry picking and it's it's so dishonest. But the way we can combat that is share something on Facebook, encourage your friends to volunteer and get involved, chip in a, f- a few dollars if you can. Those are all things that actively challenge that business model that we're seeing from a very corrupt political establishment right now. And, and we can take that into our own hands. We have the tools right now. The choice is whether do we have the courage to use them. That's what I'm asking for here. So, Stephen, I have a, a, a question of you. I want to take advantage of Mark's recommendation. We do our next Democracy Dialogues week in June. And if you can help Mark and I identify uh, a handful or more of really uh, candidates, left, right, center, it doesn't matter, who can uh, <clears throat> give us an understanding of what the new lane looks like and who those faces are, we'd be delighted to do that. Uh, the other thing I want to do, I can feel Jim uh, in the background, uh, anxious to come in and ask some questions and make some comments. Jim, will you join us for the last chunk of this? With pleasure. <laughs> so what do you think? What have you heard? Well, uh, Stephen, you're yeah, reminding me that uh, I think I was about your age uh, when I ran for Congress out in Silicon Valley and narrowly uh, lost the uh, Democratic nomination uh, and I just want to say, go, brother, go, 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 whatever we can do to uh, support uh, new thinking and new, new energy uh, in politics is, is um, uh, very important. I think the question that I'd like to pose to both of you, and starting with you, Mark, is around my perception that there's been a qualitative shift of state in politics in the United States since Donald Trump. You know, and if you remember back 25 years ago, where I think you really in good faith, and I remember observing you at the time when Mark did something that was really unprecedented, everyone. He really got in there and in, an, in the spirit of searching for common ground between Democrats and Republicans um, in a system that I think, in retrospect, was working pretty well, all things considered. I think that the change that's happened with Donald Trump is at two levels that I'd love to have both of you comment on, particularly, I think, you, Stephen, since you're running in the middle of it. Number one, Donald Trump is the first president uh, in our history, as far as I know, that has systematically now um, asserted that elections were stolen and is working 24 seven, 365 with the Republican party to actually sabotage the electoral process and suppress the vote. That's one part. And that's, that I think is a new ingredient to have a former president and an entire major party focused officially around a big lie. 
that the 2020 election was stolen and they're going to fix it by repressing the vote. The second thing that I think is, is complicating it and making it so, I would say, vicious is the way uh, Trump, not for the first time, but certainly um, in, in modern American history, has made so explicit white supremacy and racism and the alt-right. And uh, it's almost like the phenomenon of the neo-Nazis rising up uh, in the American polity so that the, it's the combination of a orchestrated campaign to sabotage the electoral process itself and encoding it within a white supremacist uh, uh, ethos that I think is what's taking democracy to the very edge. And as you all know, I mean, and George, you've said this um, uh, uh, many times before that if, if we don't win in 2022 in November, it could be lights out for democracy in the United States because of the control now that the anti-democratic forces are exerting through the legislatures and through the electoral process. Um, uh, and so I, anyway, I'd love to have you comment on that. You may not agree with what I just said, but I think I'm reflecting uh, a, a concern among progressives that there's been a shift of state in this country and we're no longer dealing with politics as usual uh, like you were 25 years ago. So I'd just love to have uh, both of you comment on that. Yeah. I'll go first and then pass, pass the talking stick to Stephen. Um, I think you've got a very knowledgeable uh, group of people on this podcast. And uh, I'm gonna recommend that somebody put in the chat the link for Jonathan Haidt's article in The Atlantic, which was called, why the last 10 years have made us uniquely stupider. <laughs> an article that's getting an enormous amount of attention. I was just at a meeting in New York with some of the leading- Wait a minute, just say that again. I didn't catch his name. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. He's the author of The Righteous Mind and the, the Righteous Mind and the Coddling of the American Mind. And now the article, this article, um, he's a social psychologist at NYU. And the title of the article is Why the Last 10 Years Have Made Us Uniquely Stupider. And um, the reason I'm recommending it is as I think it addresses your concern, Jim. He's saying that long before Trump, namely 2011, um, there started to be a shift in the culture and the shift in the patterns of social media and the shifts in communication. And those years 2011 to 2016 fertilized the soil for a Donald Trump or someone else to do the two things you talked about, which is to promote a big lie. And that includes, that's your second point, the big lie of white supremacy. Because until 2011 or until recently, let's say that the last decade, if you had a big lie you wanted to circulate, how did you do it? And how did you make the big lie go viral? And what Jonathan asserts, and I think it's true, is that social media in the beginning was not used for that. Social media at the beginning had these little walls. You used to, here were pictures of what we did on vacation and so forth. But around the beginning of that decade, 2011, there was a shift which he describes quite clearly and it became possible for big lies to spread quite successfully. And it's far more toxic than I understood. I underestimated it. And mm -hmm. I don't want others to underestimate. And I think you're doing that, both you and George are doing that by saying 2022 is kind of a break, break make it or break it moment. Um, I'm not quite as apocalyptic about it, but almost. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm hoping that there's an adjustment in the fact that we have 50 states. And I'm hoping that in the, the 50 states may be our saving grace, because I could imagine a few states going um, totalitarian, even more than they are today, or authoritarian. Um, but we have 50 states. And if Texas or Florida goes crazy, uh, that doesn't mean that Maine or Wisconsin are going to go crazy. We, we have 50 laboratories for democracy. And I think if we're coming towards a close of our session, I want to say, I really encourage folks who listen to this podcast and who are thinking about 
Jim and George's question, um, don't get too Washington focused. Remember that your own capital, uh, the own, your own capital of your own state, that your own state is actually a laboratory. And if you're starting to feel powerless when you hear us talk about Capitol Hill, uh, just remember that there's a city much closer by where you live if you're an American listening to this podcast. There's a city much closer by called the capital of your state. And there's a group called the legislature. And there's all sorts of levers of power. And I'm hoping that we see some magic in, in states like Wisconsin. We see some magic happen where other states go, oh, look what Wisconsin did. Look what Michigan did. Look what Kentucky did. And they go, oh, that really seems to work better. And that will be, start to inspire each other rather than, that, than, than, than kind of d depress each other, you know? And, 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 and that's, that's my hope. And I, I hope that that fact that we have 50 labs is gonna be our saving grace. But over to you, Stephen. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I would fully endorse what you're saying, Mark, which is uh, the Jonathan Haidt piece and that general analysis that the ingredients were all there leading up to uh, 2016 and the rise, not only of Trump, but it's really in a more, a more authoritarian style of politics. This was clearly predicted by George Washington and some of the other founding fathers when they said, when the country devolves into extreme factionalism where you've got both sides just fighting each other uh, to the death for power, uh, that creates fertile ground for not only authoritarian tendencies, but also foreign corruption and influence. That was in Washington's farewell address. So this was all very predictable. And we saw, I think, those forces in 2011, 2012. That was when I was moved to come up with the idea for a millennial action project because I was looking at those trends. And I felt that in 2011, which was the first conversation ever about what millennial action project would be, we were looking at the trends of polarization, the worst partisan polarization since the end of the civil war, the trends around disillusionment, uh, some of the lowest uh, approval ratings for Congress and the highest uh, feelings of politics not solving the problems we could face I felt like this would lead to a breakdown in American politics. And that breakdown, I think, happened around 2016, 2017, and then certainly the January 6th insurrection. But as Mark and I like to say, in the wake of a breakdown, you have the opportunity for a breakthrough. And that is why I'm running in this race for the US Senate. And I'd fully support what you said, Jim, as well, that you look at 2022, we can make a statement this year Ron Johnson is the most vulnerable incumbent U.S. Senator in 2022. We've seen him move towards the Trump lane in politics. He used to be much more independent minded, actually, but he's moved because of a lot of these incentives that we're talking about. And it's a thirst for power. He said he was going to self term limit himself. But then it's also a thirst for uh, this negative and divisive style of politics. So um, this is a huge opportunity in 2022 to not only replace someone who is elevating the opposite kind of politics that we're talking about, but more importantly, uh, replace him with something that I think is going to be much more dignified, uh, that can raise the consciousness of our public dialogue. And so I encourage us to look at this from a system point of view as Mark was telling us about, uh, and then identify these specific opportunities for a step change in our politics, which is what I see here in 2022. I also, can I just follow up though, yeah, George? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, uh, Steve, you know, Wisconsin is one of the states that is, is held up as where the Republicans are making the most concerted attempt to sabotage the electoral process. So what is it like for you running uh, to know that um, you're in a, uh, a state where there's active undermining of the democratic process. Do you feel secure that the votes are going to be counted uh, in an in honest and transparent way? Are you, uh, is there anything that you're doing differently because of the, 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 the realities um, that are, uh, you know, obviously there in Wisconsin? How's it shaping your campaign? Uh, what's going on? Yeah, I mean, 
I, I have full confidence in, in the election this year uh, that, that it will be legitimately carried through. To your point, Jim, there are real threats to it. I think the impact of those are more political in terms of the debate as opposed to um, substantive in, in how the vote and the election is conducted. We still have the Wisconsin Elections Commission, which is net nonpartisan and run by a nonpartisan person that is holding up strong despite some of these uh, active threats to, for example, try and move election administration into the partisan branch of the GOP controlled state legislative leadership that was proposed has not happened, still is being run in a nonpartisan way. And we have a highly distributed way of running elections here too. There's a lot of, of, of election authority in the local election administrators uh, who, uh, from everyone I've met, they just want to conduct the election uh, properly. So I feel confident about the election this year. We can't be blind to the real threats. I think what's more important in those threats is why they're being proposed in the first place, which is the deeper underlying tendency here around polarization. When you start to believe that the other side is fundamentally evil, which is what the data shows today, two thirds of Americans roughly believe the other side is fundamentally evil, then you start to think, well, we can't even trust them to run elections. We can't trust them to win elections. Our side needs to win every single time, which is a very anti-democratic view to hold. Um, And that's why people propose those things. And then it gets traction because you hate the other side so much, you don't want them to win. So the way we neutralize that truly is the kind of politics that Mark and the vision yeah. that Mark has spoken about is the belief that we can see the humanity in each other. We can have conversations and work together. That is the true antidote to the authoritarian politics. I think of Donald Trump and Ron Johnson. Yeah, beautifully put. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, George. Before we, uh, uh, we have some closing comments, I just want to... Um, you know, a lot of people like Haidt and others mark a point in time where the process shifted. I just want to remind us that the process shifted in 1972 when Lewis Powell wrote his memorandum uh, and changed the whole nature of politics in America. And unfortunately, as citizens, most of us were asleep to that for the greater part of 50 years, uh, while uh, people followed Lewis Powell's playbook and bought radio stations and local newspapers and impacted textbooks and uh, local government elections and all the rest of it. One of the things that I believe we need to do is wake up to the reality that this is not a new initiative that it's been working in the dark for a long time, and maybe in 2011 and ultimately in 2016, it broke through to the surface and people stopped doing it in the shadows. But we have to look seriously at a 55 year revolution that has been in process uh, that needs to be ultimately defended against and overcome from my perspective. So with that, let me turn it over to both of you for some closing comments. Um, And then Jim and I will wrap up. And uh, uh, so please, thoughts as we wrap up. I want to give Stephen the closing comment from our side. I'll just say for me, quick comment on uh, an invitation to you, George, and anybody else listening to find out if what I'm about to say is factually correct. At the meetings that I was at in New York, one of the very learned people there said that both the extreme left and the extreme right are being led by white men. That the strongest, most articulate, most articulate in in quotes, strongest powerful voices on the extreme left and extreme right um, are white men who are economically, um, you know, have economic resources and are really using their their pedestals and their platforms uh, to mount their cause. And it's, the subject I've been looking at for a long time, which I call white on white hate. That what goes on between a Kevin McCarthy and a Joe Biden, or between a Donald Trump and a Nancy Pelosi, um, that's white on white hate. Uh, there's no racism there. 
Um, and so um, I, I invite everybody, again, sharing another learning edge of mine. I'm as concerned about white supremacist thinking as anybody. I had relatives who died in Auschwitz. So I know something about white supremacy and white supremacist thinking. And here's the riddle. Why are white men populating so heavily the extreme right and the extreme left? If there's a white supremacist conspiracy, um, I think, and it's an invitation, goes back to your comment about Wetico and other deeper kind of analyses. I think there's something fundamental about power in white culture and power in white men and white male patriarchal culture that's actually devouring itself. And the mm. fact that white men are at war with each other is a sign of how deep the illness is. And it's deeper than gerrymandering, deeper than campaign finance. It actually is something cultural and psychological that we have to untangle. And I'd love to see us have a session about that sometime because it's the deeper part of this conversation that's hard to get to, but it's time to get to it. Over to you, Stephen. Well, yeah, I agree with that. And this is a, a, a very uh, complex set of um, systems that are creating the problem that we're speaking of here. And we do have to look deep and we do have to look at this in a sophisticated way. And when you think about problems like this, you, it can also lead to inaction because you think, well, it's so hard and it's so complex. What can I really do about it? And I think like any problem, you have to break it up into smaller pieces and get those victories. And so with Millennial Action Project, we would, against all of the forces, we would convene these groups of maybe five, eight, 12 legislators across the aisle to pass a bill. And sometimes there were transformative bills, but sometimes there were uh, smaller victories. But regardless of it, whether it was big or small, it kept building. It built momentum. It built, I think each victory set off like a, like a ripple, you know, Bobby Kennedy, one of my idols in 1968, he talked about the ripples of hope. And I think each of those victories was like a ripple of hope. And so I think we have to think about it in this kind of, you know, each day, how do we show up each day? How do we make a choice to, to set forth that ripple of hope? And now as I run for the United States Senate here in Wisconsin, uh, I believe we have the chance to set forth a pretty big ripple of hope. I think that the movement that we're speaking of here is, is, is rising and it's emerging and it's right at the cusp of reaching the tipping point. And a lot of people ask, why are you running this improbable campaign for the U.S. Senate? Uh, because I think we are at the cusp of that tipping point. And if we go over that threshold, I do believe there will be a pretty massive shift in our politics that's felt. Uh, and because it's not going to be just the election of one US Senator, it's going to be all of the ripples that cascade from that election as well, that I think will transform American politics. I'll leave you with this final story my favorite day of campaigning took place uh, a few months ago. We started the day in blue Madison, Wisconsin with people who come out of that fighting Bob LaFollette, if any of you know who that is, fighting Bob LaFollette, progressive tradition that goes back to uh, the early 20th century that sought for pro-democracy reforms. And a lot of those leaders were in the room who were kind of, um, uh, you know, descendants of that movement. And we lit it up. It was an amazing meeting. But then afterwards, we went up to a smaller town in central Wisconsin called Nielsville. It was a veterans event, about 60 people at a veterans memorial. And we're approaching this group. And I turned to my campaign manager and, and we quickly realized uh, there are no Democrats in this audience. And I get up and I've never given a speech, a uh, Veterans Day speech before, and uh, talk to people about some of the concrete bipartisan veterans bills we're able to pass with Millennial Action Project. But then I spoke about the deeper values of trust and integrity in our politics. And the people in this room, you could call them the exhausted majority, but afterwards they were just as fired up as the earlier group in liberal Madison. And all of a sudden I'm asking my, like myself and everyone around me, like what just happened in this room? Because we had reached that lightning in a bottle like moment. And so I asked a few women afterwards, 
what just happened here? <laughs> and one woman came up to me and she says, you know, I don't trust politicians at all. Uh, but after hearing you speak, I feel like I can trust you. You're talking about deeper values here. And those values transcend ideology. And I asked a few more women who came up to me and they said the same thing. We're leaving this event and I tell my campaign manager, this is why I'm running for office right now. If we can build this coalition from liberal Madison to a ruby red part of the state like Nielsville, Wisconsin, which voted for Trump, and we build that kind of coalition under one tent for dignity in our politics, that's gonna transform politics in Wisconsin and that's gonna ripple across this country. Uh, so that coalition is out there, uh, but we need your help to do it. Um, definitely get involved. Uh, please reach out, I'll include the links in the chat. Uh, but this is a huge, huge opportunity to make a big leap forward towards dignity in our politics. So, thank you. Stephen, <laughs> you mentioned Bobby Kennedy before. Um, and as you were speaking, I remembered, I was living in Manhattan at the time uh, when he was running and, uh, I was sitting on the balcony of my apartment building, which was on the Upper East Side. And I heard some bullhorn saying something in the street. And the next thing you know, uh, a car pulls up, Bobby Kennedy gets up and jumps out on the, the roof of the car. And within about five minutes, there were 20,000 people. <clears throat> in the street that's a ripple of hope yeah. you know yeah. i just want to jim you can take us out uh in addition to thanking you both stephen and mark for this wonderful conversation and certainly mark an opportunity and an invitation to come back in the next week and let's explore some of the deeper topics and stephen to you a reminder get us those five or ten uh, four, three, whatever they are, candidates, and let's let's give them a platform. Uh, I want to tell our audience that tomorrow, uh, on the second day, the topic is the state of the states. And uh, Jenna Griswold, who's the Colorado uh, Secretary of State, she's the youngest in the country. Uh, sorry, that Bobby Kennedy image is still with me. Um, anyway, she'll be on, um, and uh, she's also the chair of the uh, Democratic Association of Secretary of State, so she'll have some really interesting perspectives. Eleanor LeCain, who was an assistant secretary of state in Massachusetts, will be joining us, and there's a good chance we'll have a couple of other uh, surprise guests, so be with us tomorrow. Uh, another view on how we deal with democracy and what we can do to save it. Jim, you want to take us out? Thank you, George. Thank you, Mark. I uh, really appreciate your, your deep wisdom that's come out of decades of work around reconciliation and transpartisan politics. And I just want to acknowledge, Mark, everything you've done to reunite America. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a deep well from which you speak. So I just want to acknowledge you today and would love to uh, have a whole session as George just indicated on this uh, issue that you brought up right at the end on white on white hate. I think there's a very, very profound discussion that uh, we need to have around that. And I just wanna say your name, Stephen, Stephen Alacara, running for the US Senate in Wisconsin. And everybody in Wisconsin vote for Steve. And those of you who are outside Wisconsin, um, uh, put up your uh, website, uh, Stephen, and we, we should all uh, contribute and do everything we can because this young man represents the future of America. Because if he can pull off the deep blue with the ruby red uh, in a coalition of, of deep hope that a center is possible uh, in this country, uh, the ripples of hope that would reverberate out there uh, could change uh, the course of our history moving into the future. So Steve, I just want to acknowledge your courage at this moment of complexity 
uh, to run for the U.S. Senate in, in Wisconsin, and we wish you all the best. Thank you very so, much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, George. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow for day two of our five-day program on democracy uh, in the United States. Bye for now. Blessings. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant session, guys. Brilliant yeah. session.